another adventure. I headed up to meet the group. It's a little after 7, about 7.14. I'm taking a blue bike today. Uh, my plan is to just kind of get some K's in my legs. I did some hard intervals this week just to kind of see how my body would feel. And I'm a bit tired from the week, not necessarily the interval. So we'll get some interesting clips for you all. On this ride, I left Northampton, rode into the woodlands, picked up the group at the Alden Village Center, we headed out Fish Creek Boulevard, went to 2854, at 2854 we headed east, we took Old Sap Road, all the way out to 105, Foy Mountain Road, we filmed, we stopped at the boathouse, then we continued, and the film ended when we were crossing the lake. After we crossed the lake, I backed off the pace and we hit Mount Pleasant Road and rode solo until I got back to Taco Corner. And then Paul and I continued to ride through Montgomery, Spring Branch Road, back through Keenan. It was a very pleasant day for a ride. Um, the group had a good turnout and I think that you will like the clip that we put together for you. I decided to let the group go to work. We lost like two members of the group by the time we got to Mount Pleasant. And I think it was just the changes in pace. We're not really riding steadily as I had hoped and as I requested. So I decided to just go ahead and do my own thing. But I think you would love the clips that we got for you. We're on the open road. The FM2978. Sandera Ranch Road. We're headed north. Uh, the my uh, cadence meter, the battery went kaput. You know, once the weather changes, it cools off a little bit. All these weak batteries show themselves. That's why you see no cadence. And I don't have the power meter on the blue bike. So I didn't plan on using it anyway, but we'll just use speed and heart rate. My goal was to stay aerobic as much as possible. I had some intense workouts during the week, so that was my plan anyway. I had requested in the parking lot that those who felt good should take longer poles because it's a windy morning. The, the wind is blowing from the northwest, so that means right now it's in our face and coming from the left because of the, the, the front that brought the cooler weather in. So we had a good turnout, and not everybody wanted a hammer, but you can't get these guys to ride together because certain people come and they want to put on a show. And so for me, after the, the lake, after we crossed the lake, I just got tired of it. We lost like two members of the group, and I decided I was just going to do my own thing. It's a group ride. It's not a race. People ride to where they're riding over their heads, and then when they get when they get home, they're wiped out. And the thing is, is everybody has different plans, so I don't try to restrict anybody. But if you're not gonna ride with me, <laughs> you're not gonna get any help from me. And so after a while, it gets old, and I just decide. So I decided to pull the pin on Mount Pleasant Road, and I did my own ride. And then Paul happened to be waiting for me at Taco Corner, so he and I finished the ride together. That's kind of what you have to do. You have to choose who you ride with. So if you really want to stick to a certain range of efforts, you have to get very disciplined riders to ride with, or you ride by yourself. So most of my rides, I ride about, let's say, in a seven-day week, I'll do two hard rides, and the rest of them are easy. Because that's really what it takes for you to improve. You don't improve by doing every ride hard because you'll never recover. Physiology of the human body does not work that way. But a lot of riders are not aware. So they do one speed the whole year and those who are doing it properly, when they go hard, it's very hard. There's no point in riding medium when you can go faster than that when you decide to go hard. So you kind of have to decide what works for you. So most of the ride really, uh, you will see me take some pulls or whatever early in the ride to help the group along. But I was still in my aerobic zone. I didn't really push too hard 
But once we started going over the bridge, the pace just got a lot faster than it should have been, in my opinion. And we started losing riders at the back. And once we turned into the forest, I decided I was going to drop the effort. You have to make that decision and do the, the workout that works for you, regardless of who you're riding with. That's very important. We had a new rider today. His name is Ed. He joined. Uh, we invited him to the to the ride. He's. I think he's pulling right now. This is Dan Jaworski. Uh, Look at that sky, is that beautiful or what? So it's hard to get, uh, to find the perfect group for you. Really, once you get above three or four riders, probably above four riders, it's hard to really keep the discipline of the group. Uh, a smaller group is easy, easily focused more than a larger group. So you just have to decide, okay, I'm just gonna sit in and wheels you know, when they start to go harder and then depending on what effort you plan to do that way, that day you have to decide when to back off the pace and stay within your prescribed zone. You have to know how to train, especially if you're self-coached and you've done your research. Because it's important to not do unproductive training. Going hard all the time does not make you fast. <laughs> Yeah, you have to know when to do it. It just makes you tired. You, you don't want to ride slow all the time either. Slow meaning you don't want to do just zone two training. But you have to know what you're doing. Oh yeah, with my gear. I'm here to go on uh, adventure. <laughs> So at this point, I'm just sitting in the wheels, keeping my effort in zone one. So when you've done the proper amount of training and you increase your metabolic capacity, you can sit in on a fast ride and be in a low zone. But you have to have the discipline to get yourself there. When you're untrained, then yeah, you end up being in an anaerobic zone early with very little efforts. We're going up a grade and we're going into the wind. It is not easy here doing 20, 20 to 21 miles an hour. It's a nice effort. As a result, I'm creeping into zone three. I prefer to stay in zone two and then go straight to zone four if I'm going to do that or higher than to sit around zone three a lot. And my heart rate is hovering right above zone two right now. And that's when you want to decide, okay, you use your skills, sit in on the wheels. To be efficient because when you come to the front you should have used the draft enough to where you can take a little pull if the pace is not too high for you because if you can you should help the group you ride with And when you do take your pull, do the same effort the last rider was doing. Not speed, effort. Don't go up there and start sprinting. This is Ed who was pulling, pulled off, it's drifting to the back. Good job, Ed. 
Ed is from New Jersey. From Joyzy. So you see how right now this we're doing 31 Ks, about 18 to 19 miles an hour. So let's say this other rider, that whoever's pulling right now, when they pull off, you want to do the same effort because the speed may change because out of the wind will pick up because we're going into the wind or the grade might be higher. So you can't do it by speed. You got to do it by effort, how it feels. Don't try to go up there to show, oh, I'm very strong. Do what the group, keep that train moving. And even if somebody comes around, let's say they're not happy with what you're doing, because we get that a lot in our groups, you don't necessarily have to get on their wheel. Let them go. The problem we have in our group is once one person comes around, everybody else starts coming around you. <laughs> you know. So when I'm at the front and I decide I'm not going to go harder, when they all come around, I just slip back on the back. On the back. If I can sit in the wheels and be in the zone, I want to, the, my prescribed zone, then fine, I'll stay with them. If they're going to where they get me out of my prescribed zone for that day and that workout, I'll let them go. And I stay in my zone because I know what I'm working on. So based on how my week went, I didn't plan on going very hard on this ride. And I'm not just talking about my cycling week, just my whole week. I had a very stressful week. I had a lot going on. So today was more of a long, steady ride for me. But it doesn't mean that's their plan. So that's that's another reason I don't try to restrict the group. I try to suggest, and I did in the parking lot off camera. I suggested let's ride together because it's very windy today. This guy took his pull. He's, he kept the effort the same. I think his name is Don. But we have certain riders in the group. So that they take over, they want to act like they're racing somebody. Instead of just keeping the effort steady. They don't know how to ride steadily. That doesn't make you fast. You just, if you're riding like that all the time and you never recover, you will just remain average. And so when, we, when those of us who are on the proper training program, when we decide to go fast, it will be very fast for you. Because all you've been doing is average. Your body doesn't know how to go really fast. Because a few, I think it was a couple of months ago in the forest and I was launching some attacks and the gaps that I was opening was, there were huge gaps real quick. I did a couple of attacks and the gaps were very large. That's the way I like to ride. Easy and very hard. No middle of the road crap. I'm doing, uh, I, this. my ride was almost seven hours. So seven hours, I'm not gonna be doing anaerobic efforts. That was my plan, so I don't hold the group to it. I just, I suggest stuff to keep the group together. And it, it rarely pans out that way, especially on Saturday. Everybody comes on Saturday, they want to hammer. But after a while, you get tired of that. So then you just have to decide, hey, I'm not riding with these guys anymore. <laughs> and just for the day. And then you just do your own thing. Nothing wrong with that. So you see the first guy that was there was Ed. He pulled off. He, he had pulled for a long time. This other guy took his pull. Don't feel like you have to match the length of time another rider pulled for. Pay attention to you. Know your limitations. Know your fitness level. So if you're feeling good and you feel that like you can stay up there longer, fine. Stay up there. But make sure you don't sacrifice yourself to where after you get off, you're not going to be able to stay with the group if they stay steady. You have to learn that. Don't, don't pull beyond your capability to try to impress people. Pull based on the fact that, hey, I can handle this pace and I got plenty left when I'm done. Don't sit up there to where when you pull off, you waste it. You should pull off knowing that you got much more for the length of the ride. It's a long ride. This is at least four hours of riding in rolling terrain and the wind. So you got to watch that. So the, the ride is harder. You can see my heart rate has hit 160. Now, it, I, I like to use heart rate because 
it lets me know what's going on with my metabolic system. Power, power meter does not give me that. Power meter just says you're putting out this, this number of watts. Speed says we're doing 28K. My body is saying you're in the bottom of zone four. Now that's based on how my week went, how recovered I am from everything else, not just working out, just life this week. So I know that, that I knew I didn't want to go hard and I'm going harder right now than I had planned. So I watched that. You can see it's hovering 164, 163. The, the thing is, is that heart rate will vary. When I'm very fresh, my heart rate is higher. And that's for most people. When you're very rested or you're not as fit, your heart rate variability is higher. When you're, when you're a little fatigued, your heart rate is lower. I hope that makes sense. When, you're, when I'm tired, I can't get my heart rate to, to go up as easily. So it's good to be rested when you do a very hard workout so that you can really hit those markers. Because right now for this effort, it feels like 165 or higher, even though it's saying 160. So I know I'm a little fatigued. Not just from working out, like I said, for just how my week went with sleep and everything. It wasn't my best week. Had a lot going on. So my heart rate is reading lower than how I feel. I feel worse than 154. <laughs> That's important for you to watch that. Heart rate is very relevant. Heart rate lets you know how your body is responding to the stimulus the stress that you're putting on it from this effort. So even if you just wrote a heart, wore a heart rate monitor and you sat at your desk and your, and your co-worker starts stressing you out, your heart rate will go up. Just try that one day. <laughs> and maybe set beeps. That would be fun. You set some beeps, put, put little beeps on there to where when you go above like 110 beats per minute, it will beep. So if somebody comes and stresses you out at work and it gets over 110, let your heart rate monitor beep. They'll freak out probably. But that's really how it works. It's, it's stress. The body does not care where the stress comes from. It can come from just a conversation, heat, uh, whatever else is going on with you, you know, psychosomatic, whatever, and then exercise and whatever else. All of that is stress. So if you have a stressful week, don't ride very hard that week. Ride your bike, but keep the effort low because you already got other stuff that's been stressing you. That is not the, the, the week to really push very hard. It's really important. You see, Dan, Dan is holding the same effort that Laura was holding. 18, 19 miles an hour into this wind and rolling. Now we're going downhill, so the speeds are going to go up, but he's not going to increase the effort. This is riding together. We didn't, we didn't get this the whole ride. So on the way back, I just decided enough. There's always someone who wants to put on a show and it's just, it's not necessary. And I don't need to be in, I don't need to be in their audience because that's what they want is an audience. Because if you want to do that, if you don't want to ride with a group, why'd you come to the group ride? They broke up the group. We, we lost a couple of riders, you know, and it was like, I'm, I'm hoping there were new faces. They, they're new to this ride. As far as I'm concerned, I hadn't ridden with them before. But it was my, my goal is when I see a new face, I want to encourage them to come back. And going out there and riding away from people does not encourage them to come back. What's the point of that? So the road's going up, there's wind, that's why it's 28K. And you can see that because Dan took over, my heart rate has dropped almost 10 beats since he took over. Because he's his effort is more measured. I think Laura was going harder than he was. But Dan's not trying to impress anybody. He's pulled off, he tapped, he tapped out. Paul Ilunga is gonna take over. I'm probably in third position at this point. I think Frank is on Paul's wheel and I'm behind Frank. 
Paul's going to pull. We're going to be turning right. We're going east. We're going to be turning right at the top of the hill. So Paul's not trying to do 30K up this hill because the wind and this incline here, let's see, 3%. But we're going into a stiff headwind. So he's holding the effort, not worried about speed. You can see my heart rate has not changed much. It's gone up two beats. Well, three now, but we're almost finished. That's how you ride. That's what they mean when they say hold the effort. Don't worry about speed. You can do it by feel. You can tell when you're going harder. There's another cyclist on here that we're coming by. So in the winter, we're always fighting the wind going north. And, and today, the wind is coming from in our face and to the left, it's northwest. It cooled the temperatures down, down here. So I'm wearing my aero jersey today because it's perfect for this kind of weather. It's not very good for very humid weather. Turning and this is the eastern piece of 2854, the FM 2854 that we're coming to. So in a little bit, uh, there will be, I think it's an ambulance or a fire truck or something coming from the left. I think this car goes before he gets there, but then we wait. So Frank is asking Paul where we're going, and Paul said we're going all the way to Longmire. And I think Frank misinterpreted that it meant that we're going on this road all the way to 45. So you will see he will be going straight. We'll have to let him know because he didn't look at the map, obviously, because we've been out here many times before. So Paul told him we're going all the way to Longmire because that's where we're going, but we're going the way of Sap Road or whatever. Yeah, so I put my hand, uh, arm out because Paul was going to move, but then he realized there's an ambulance or something coming. I know it was a fire truck. That guy that pulled out that car, he stopped. Because we got the green light here. Yes, yeah, fire truck. So I was behind a uh, Frank. So Frank is coming to take his pull. I'm gonna ride up to his wheel. Cause we don't like for Paul to sit up there with the camera filming the road. Yeah, so. We're not on this road very long. Uh, the traffic is fast, but uh, since they repaved it, we got a, a nicer shoulder. There's some animal, some road kill. Funny, I spotted it right there. It's a dead bird or something. We're gonna be on this road for another maybe two miles. Probably three kilometers. And then we're gonna turn left. And that's where Frank's gonna miss the turn, so we'll have to call out to him. There are a lot of rides in the area. Uh, there's an app I talked about on one of the other videos called Chasing Watts. I've started looking out, out there more frequently. And there are certain rides, like there was one on Sunday I was gonna do, but something happened and I couldn't make the ride. But I like to check it out because you can see who's going to attend. There are certain riders I prefer not to ride with because they're dangerous and they make the group look bad. So there are a couple of rides during the week, like when Laura was running the Romeo rides, I did all the rides that she had. But I always check out the ride and see who's going to be there. Because the, we have certain people in the area here that will come, and every, all of you in this line, but they're, they're in traffic, annoying and pissing off the drivers. And they do it repeatedly, and the ride leader has said nothing. But this person keeps coming back to the ride. So whenever those kind of people show up, I don't attend the ride. I ride by myself. I don't need to be with a group that's going to be pissing off the drivers. 
I don't need that. I don't need that kind of attention. So pick the groups that you ride with carefully. Ride with people who are doing things properly that you can learn from. Do not ride with people that are dangerous or unsafe or doing things the wrong way. Because your bike has one saddle. You don't need a group. Just remember that. So I look to see who's who's signed up to do the ride. And depending on who's there, I decide, okay, I'm not riding. I'm not doing that ride. And then I go off and do my own thing. I still get my workout in. Because uh, there's no point in riding with people who are reckless or careless or inconsiderate. It creates a bad representation for our sport. And I don't want to be no part of that. And the ironic thing is they are aware, but they, just, they don't change their habits. I have time for that. We have a guy in the air. Everybody would be sitting like this. He'll have his butt over the white line like he's something special. <laughs> I don't got time for that. And expects other people to say car back. I don't say nothing. You sit up there when they buzz you a couple of times, you'll get off the road. And I mean, in situations where we're trying to make sure we're facilitated for the other road user to get by, and he acts like he's not aware of what we're trying to do. You're going to ride with a group? Be with a group. You all need to operate like a unit. So a lot of times I prefer to ride alone. I don't, ride with no, I don't need the headaches. So pick your groups carefully. So the whole time I'm sitting close to Frank, as you can see, uh, the terrain here is relatively flat. Plus, we've got the wind behind us because it's blowing from the west and from the north on our left. So we've got like a cross tailwind here. So it's not that. So I'm staying in zone one. And so my effort is low. For the most part, I'm pedaling close between 90 and 95. 85 to 95, most of the range. Uh, it's nice to have the feedback from the cadence meter. When I got back, I replaced the battery. It was fine. The battery just went kaput. When you have a weak battery, same thing with your car. When you, our battery's down here. As soon as you get weak in the car, the first cold front we get, people have problems starting their car. You know, those slow starts. And you, either you get it charged and make sure you can hold the charge, or you get a new battery. Especially after two to three years. Most batteries will last two to three years, depending on how you've used the car. But the winter, once the cold weather sets in, it will always let you know <laughs> if your battery is weak or not. So we're going to be turning. That's why you see me do that. I already checked my mirror. There's a left turn. Frank is on aware. He should know if he had looked at the, the, the map. But I could tell by the way he was riding that he was not he, he was not aware that we're turning. Frank! 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 I told him, I said, that's what you get for not looking at the map. You're going somewhere. You don't look to see where you're going. Please. <laughs> yeah. At least look at where the turns are at a minimum. Careful. Up. Careful. Yeah, I point to the car that's coming. It's in the distance, but I'm letting everybody know. I'm going to look back to make sure everybody has come through. I'm making sure the group is together because I plan on going ahead and taking the lead. And I'm going to keep the effort the same, close to what Frank was doing. So you see, I'm pointing at obstacles. Instead of yelling hole or whatever, you just point. It's so effective. And, and, and in addition to that, where I place myself, this road is quiet. 
it's not very busy. We're going through a private neighborhood here. This is called O105. I'm pointing at imperfections in the pavement where they've just dropped asphalt and they didn't take any care to really smooth out the patching. You know what I mean. And they're like little baby speed bumps. They're not fun to go over. Somebody said hole. That was the only time on this ride that I heard hole. And I told Paul about it. I heard it one time, never again. Because no one else said hole. I pointed at it. Why are you saying hole? Point at it. And let them know we're turning right. Then I'm going to wave my hand. Let them know there's imperfections in the corner. People dropped asphalt. And they create little speed bumps. It's not fun to go over them. And this is a grade when you turn. You can see where it says four point something percent. I'm looking back to make sure everybody's kind of in the line. I'm not pushing hard. And then I sit. And then resume. So this is how you take your pull. So now, because I'm at the front, I'm at the top of zone two. When I was in the back behind Frank, I was in zone one back there. Plus, we had a tailwind. In this direction, we got a lot of shelter because of the trees and the building on the left and so forth. We're not exactly going north. We're going kind of northeasterly at this point. But it's going to go It's going to go north. See how we're moving more to the north now. But there's, there's enough wind to where all I'm doing is I'm keeping the effort the same. That's what everybody was doing, you know, about 18, 18 miles an hour or so. That's good enough. It's not so much by speed, but by feel. Because I can do this effort for hours in these conditions. And it will give me a good workout. So when I let them go, that's what I was doing. I was doing about 18, between 18, 20 miles an hour. Because they wanted to do 25 plus into the wind and up the hill and all that. I was in, in the mood for all that. That's not what I wanted. See, that's off camera. But this is how you take your pull. So I'm taking a long pull. So there's no point in me killing myself. It's 20 miles an hour because the conditions are easier here. Wherever we're going. I am not changing my effort. You see my heart rate is actually coming down. I keep my cadence crisp. So I'm on top of the gear. So Paul's drifting back. This guy asked me if he was all right. He said, yeah. He's drifting back so he doesn't have to film the road again. He had just pulled. That's Ed. I think it's Toronello. I hope I pronounced it correctly. I pronounced it correctly. He's an Italian writer. Probably third or fourth generation Italian. <laughs> His people are from the old country, but he's he's probably you know four, fourth or fifth generation. Who knows? But he says I'm not a real Italian. We were talking about it in the parking lot. I knew what he meant, meaning he was born here, not from the old country. A lot of Italians refer to their country as the old country. I used to watch the Golden Girls. I used to like the character played by Estelle Getty. Sophia Petrillo. <laughs> She's a tell stories in 1812. Picture this, you know, those of you who watch that, I, I like that. That's kind of cool. The Italians have a rich heritage. The land of Ferrari. Ed is a, a, a Ed's got a big engine. Ed sit at the front for hours, <laughs> turning out like a Sean Yates kind of rulier. He's like a rulier. The first time I rode with Ed was last Sunday, but he's been in the area for a while. He's been between here and New Jersey for some time, but I think this is going to be his new home. So it's nice to have him out here. It's a former competitive bicycle racer. So the effort stayed the same between 149 155 you want to do it by range it's just that range so i'm saying right at the top of zone two that's it 
Then when you get back, if the bunch, depending on what the bunch is doing, you get back in the bunch, you can drop down to the lower twos or high ones. We're going to turn right. This is 105. Now I'm going to pull off. So I waved, I waved them up. I'm keeping my gear rolling so I can get back in. We're going to an area with a street called Foy Mountain Ro Road and it it is steep. It has a nice kicker in excess of 12, it was about 12 to 15, about 15 percent at the end of it. So when you're at the front and you're pulling, yeah, you're working harder than the people in the back. So after your pull, when you get back, your goal should be, if you need to get a drink, get a drink, whatever, but get in the wheels, get into shelter, so your body can recover from the effort you just put out. That's what I, I always talk about when somebody's doing, say, 20 miles an hour and you take over, keep it around there. So they can get a chance to go back in, catch the breath, take a drink, whatever, and settle down. That person is more likely to come back later in the ride and take another pull. It's a group ride. It's not a race. Because in a race, he or she wouldn't be pulling that long. And even in a race, if they did take a pull and you attack them, you better keep going because they're not going to work with you anymore. <laughs> That's just the way cycling works. Why should they? Unless, you know... You, if I take a pull and you attack me, that's it, we hit a breakaway. I'm going to sit on you. I'm not taking another pull. And, and that's what happens in the races sometimes. And, and the, the people in the breakaway fool around and get caught by the pack in the last kilometer or so. Because they're messing around. I was told a long time ago, it, it, it's a lot better to be in a group of three and cross the line. At least you're on the podium than to mess around and have to sprint against 20 other guys. <laughs> so once you, you did all that work to get in the breakaway, why would you let yourselves get caught? And I'm saying yourselves because it's on all of you. He's telling Ed because Ed is, may not be familiar with where we're going. I mean, he's ridden out here before, according to what someone said in the parking lot. But um, we're going to be turning left at the next light. So I'm back there and I'm watching the cars. And I'm going to get there. We have three lanes of traffic to go across. So we're on the shoulder and there are three lanes to go across before we can do the left turn. The left turn is like a fourth lane. They finally finished all that construction. The construction was to put those yellow line markers you see made out of concrete in the middle they're doing that throughout the area to separate traffic and get rid of those open center turn lanes that used to be there when it was more rural with the growth so i'm already out there that's why these guys are in this lane i've already motioned to the cars they're backing off i'm letting them know and i'm gonna thank them because all of us are gonna come over and we can make our left turn but the light doesn't change for bikes here, so I'm gonna let Ed and them know that once the car is clear on the other side, let's go ahead and go across. We're going into a neighborhood. You see me go to the front to let Ed know. Because there's no car behind us, and this sensor that you see the little cracks in the concrete, it doesn't pick up bicycles. It's not sensitive enough. Come up and let him know. Once the traffic clears, we're going. It 
doesn't pick us up. So that's why I just told him that after that last car, it's clear we're going to go. So we'll cut through here because it's quiet, it's lumpy. It, it, I think it has the steepest pitch we have in the area. It probably, yeah, I think it's like 15%, but it's short, you know, on, on that turn, on that turn. Not sure where that driver's going at. Laura waved at him. Everybody gets excited. I, I'm just, I've ridden this area here. We used to come here and do repeats. I know this climb. So I'm not in a hurry to go too hard yet. I'm just going, I'm just riding the climb. So look at the grade, it's 5% or so. We're gonna go up in about maybe 5,000 meters or so. We're gonna turn right and it's gonna just kick up. It's like a wall. See it levels off and now it's going back up. It gets there in a hurry. You see it went to zero, now it's like six, six point something. When we turn right, it really kicks up. If you're not in the right gear, it's too late to shift because you, you're under a lot of load. It's saying 10%, 11, flash briefly. Depends on how you take it. One time I came through, it said 15%. I guess I must have been on the outside. It says 11 again. So 11%, the line I'm taking. So I'm at the bottom of zone four here. Actually in zone four. So now it's really weird now. We rode the hill. We turned left back there. Now we're going to turn left here. Then everybody sits up. I'm like, no, I don't like to stop after a hard effort. So you're going to see me come to the front. I don't want to stop. You don't clear lactate when you stop. You got to keep your legs moving. Yes, sir. So all of a sudden, it's like the power's off. And you're going to see me. They're, they're, they're all together. So I'll move to the left, I think, and go around. I want to keep keep my legs going. I want us to just keep going. Let's keep the pace line going. You see Ed gets in line. Laura's going to go. Yeah, we don't need to sit up. Let's go. We're going to be turning in a bit to go to Longmire Road. This is what Paul was telling Frank back there when Frank asked, are we going all the way? And Paul said, we're going all the way to Longmire Road. That's the road he was talking about that we're going to now. And I think Frank misunderstood what Paul's response meant. And he thought Paul meant we're going all the way on 2854 to 45. <laughs> so I'm basically holding a group pace. You know, my heart rate is back to in the 140s or whatever. I'm just holding a group pace. When you're standing, you, your gear needs to be slightly higher than where you would be in if you were seated. And as soon as you sit, you can shift down if you need to. But a lot of times I don't bother. I just keep the same, keep the same ratio. 
I'm letting them know we're turning left. This is Longmire Road. That's what Paul was telling Frank. We're going all the way to Longmire. He figured Frank knew how we're getting here. We don't go to 45. That just that would be right the feeder. It's just too busy and too many lights. This is a prettier way to get out here. I love this area. In fact, uh, as I do this recording, there is a ride tomorrow, which is Tuesday. And I believe Romeo is coming the same route. Now, it is clear I had just taken a long pull back there. I rolled up here because there was a gap in the line and I just wanted to fill it. We're going to do two abreast here. And uh, the guy up there sitting next to Ed is going to pull off. Because, you know, Ed's like a diesel. He'll sit up there all day. And so I get up there and I realize mm, I just pulled back there. I need to not go too hard. And I will stay there for a little bit and get off of there. You need to listen to yourself all the time. Throw your ego out the window. Listen to how you feel when you get up to the front or wherever you are in a bunch. Your, your goal should be, you should not be at your limit if you can avoid it early in the ride or even the middle in the ride if that's not your intent. So don't try to prove anything to prove how long you can sit at the front or whatever. I may have mentioned that before. Listen to yourself. And the guy who's pulling next to Ed, he does exactly what I'm talking about. He's not going to sit up there all day. He's, in a little bit, he will get off the front. Then I end up there. I stay there for a few strokes and then I get off. I mean, a few strokes. I don't know how long, maybe 30 seconds. I was there for a bit. But after a while, I realized, hey, I just pulled back there. Let me not do too much work because we have a lot of people who haven't put their nose in the wind yet. The road goes up here. The effort's going to go up. You will see my heart rate go up. I mean, you just see it going up steadily like that. We're going into the wind, and it's 2% here, 2 point something, whatever. It's a decent effort. It continues. And I think right after we finish it, that guy's going to pull off. I'm using a large gear on purpose. I just wanted to work my legs here. So you see I'm mo moving my upper body more. That's how Mark's and them used to climb. <laughs> and the guy, yeah, he pulled off. So I'm going to roll through. I'll probably shift up in a bit when I realize, well, I really didn't want to spin up here. The road's going up again, you can see. I'm putting more force in the pedals. We're not going very hard, you know, 18 miles an hour, but it's a grade, and then you got the wind. There was a slight downhill. As I said, minus 2.0. I think we're going downhill. I wake Paul up because I realized, okay, I've just been pulling back. I don't need to be up here. I didn't want to sit up there. You can see my heart rate went up to 160. I'm like, ah, I got to get it below 150. About 150, 152. It's like my zone 2. That's where I start crossing over and using more cards. You got to find your crossover points. There are many ways you can find it. I mean, other than invasive methods of lactate testing and that kind of stuff. And as you condition yourself, those crossover points get higher.
So this will take us to a road called Little Egypt Lane in about probably two kilometers or so. Then we get to Highway 830. And it gets really fast on that. It was fun. Little Egypt Road. We're we'll gonna be turning right. There's a piece of the road here where they drop the asphalt very carelessly. So it's like a natural speed bump where it meets the concrete. Right there, you see me stand? I'd already let people know it was there. I think it's right there, it's like a bump. That's just, you know, I'm sure they could have done a better job than that because even in a car you would feel that. It's like it has a mound where the asphalt meets the concrete. This entire stretch here, as you can see, it says 4%. It's up and down until we get to 830. So we're doing about 17, 18 miles an hour. We're doing 17 and 18 miles an hour. But it's hard because this is a slight grade. Now it's going downhill here. But it's a grade and it's windy. 
<laughs> I've dubbed the wind kind of, but we're going into a stiff headwind from the north. That's why it's just 20 C for, for us. It feels a little cooler than that. If you notice the whole time Ed's been up there, the pace has been steady. So his intent is to take a long, steady pull. Keep the group moving. Not break it up into pieces. Gonna be turning left. Highway 830 here. The road is going to start going downhill and the speeds are going to pick up. Uh, right now the effort is about the same, but because of the terrain we're going faster. We are going into the wind and the wind is coming from the right and in our face. Because it's blowing from the north and from the west. And we are headed west. So we've gone faster on this road, but on this day with the wind in our face, you know, we've gone in the 40s, 40 some miles an hour here before. So Paul stays on the right so he doesn't have to brake, then he slides back behind the pirate. I'm just sitting in the wheels. And the entire time, because I'm so close to the white line, I keep my eye, I glance at my mirror periodically to keep my eye on the other road users so I can know when to use the road like there. 
because I'm using the road so I don't have to hit my brakes at all. And then as soon as they start going, I'll just slip back behind the wheel I'm following. There's water on the road, okay. Oh, no, actually, there's somebody walking. He got off the road, but uh, yeah. And then there's a stretch where there'll be water. Water has pooled because we had a lot of rains with this new front. There's a lot of water on the right. We end up using the road. I think that's what Dan is motioning. So we're going to get on the road. You can see where I am. You'll see the water to the right there. So once Dan passes, I'm going to slip right on his wheel. It's a minimal effort. And those are the skills you work on when you're riding a group. You know, it's important if you're going to do mass start events or whatever to practice this. You don't need a big group to practice. You just need another rider or two. That's it. You're only following one rider at a time. I'm looking in my mirror to make sure nothing's coming. And I use the wind to slow me down. And at this point, I know that at the end of this stretch, the road is going to go up. So I'm staying on top of whatever gear I'm in, but you don't want to spin too much to where you, you get out of breath or whatever. So I'm in a comfortable gear. The road's starting to go up. See the grade 2%? Three. Once it starts going up, everybody gets excited. And it looks like Ed did not downshift. I think he's one of just work that same gear. He's working it. That improves your strength. We're going to be turning soon, so all of this, I'm not going that hard because I know there's a light coming up. We're going to be turning. right here this road goes straight to the lake it dead ends into the lake down there see the speeds are about the same 18 miles an hour or so this wind is stiff <laughs> and so I'm a little above sweet spot approaching zone 4 and we're only doing 18 miles an hour that's why when you launch an attacks going into the wind it's kind of a suicide mission sometimes depending on what level you're at 
it is harder fighting the wind. We're going to be turning soon. I'll let them know that we're making a left turn. I think Dan will pass it on. Yeah. Because they're coming to the, to the turn and they weren't slowing down. I knew I better let them know. So in a little bit, there's a long descent. And we're going to be coming up to the boathouse. This is a good pull by Abby. He's keeping it steady, moving the group along. We're descending, so the speeds are going to go up. It's actually a nice climb coming the other way. On these kind of roads, when I'm descending, I always keep my eye on those cars that are parked to make sure there's nobody in them. <laughs> that can be about to back up in your path. You always got to be scanning. I think I'm in third position. I'm right behind Paul. Abby turns off the power here. He pulls off. I'll go ahead and go through. My brother, the meat lover, <laughs> the one and only. <laughs> Your brother. <laughs> This is the first stop on the ride. The boathouse right on the left there. It's a sh I think it's a Shell gas station also. I'll let you guys see us, how we park our bikes and unload. I always try to make sure I've got two things touching my bike. That's Don over there. I got to meet him. You said we've ridden together before. I didn't remember. 
You remember bikes more than people a lot of times unless you spend a lot of time with them. I was going to lean my bike on that post, but then I saw this broken piece of thing down there. I'm like, eh, I'm going to put it on the wall here. So I'm going to use my wheel on that thing and the bars. You always want like two contact points minimum. Been fighting that wind for almost two hours, well, 90 minutes. So there's 90 minutes into the ride. So I don't know what you guys did, but this is uh, part of what we did on Saturday. So I'm chatting with Paul over there. I didn't realize the camera was running until he said, oh, let me go turn the camera off. So I saw this footage. I figured I'd just let it run. And you know, it's a cool day, so I really only drank one bottle. So I've got a full bottle on my bike. So I didn't even go inside the store because I did not need any fluids. Because I drink before I get on the bike. Then I load up two bottles on these long rides. I don't do sugars until maybe after two hours into the ride, minimum, because I don't need them. That's why I try to keep my effort down. As you can see, I'm standing around. My heart rate still 130. That tells me that I'm not recovering as well as I should. So I didn't really have a very restful week, so to speak. <laughs> there were a lot of stuff going on. So that's how you got to gauge it. That's why I like to pay attention to my heart rate. So everybody's just standing and chatting. Some people are in the store getting stuff. And, you know, we stop mostly for biological breaks and so forth. It's not to rest. <laughs> you know, it's just it's a stop, especially in the summer. We gauge the stop based on what the weather's doing. So people can load up and so forth. So. Yeah, my...